driving Hope comes and stops us in our tracks Bravely we prove in our striving Trudging together each day Hello, everyone. This is Raw Recovery. I am Gary. I am your host, and this is a Trudging Together podcast. And today we have the pleasure of having Danielle in the studio with us. Uh, and she's going to share her experience, strength, and hope. She, she and I are both in Overeaters Anonymous. We're both in the same home group. And I am going to turn it over to Danielle now and let her do her thing. Go ahead, Danielle. Hi, Gary. Thank you for having me. Um, It it was an honor to ask to do this, actually. So about me. um, So, okay. I'm a little off. All right. So I was born into a very large family, very large Italian family at that. And um. You know, I mean, their way to show love was with food and buying things. You know, you got presents oh, yeah. um, or you got fed or one or the other, you know. Uh, there wasn't much affection. There wasn't much hugging or saying I'm proud of you or right. I love you. It was if you did something, good, you either got an ice cream after school or you got a gift, you know, one or the other or both. Mm. Sometimes it depends. Uh, when I was born, I lived in Queens in my grandparents' house. Uh, we lived upstairs and they owned the house. And so it was the perfect scenario because my grandparents were, well, my grandfather, not so much my grandmother, was very, very affectionate. Um, he loved his grandchildren very much. So for the first six years of my life, the memories that I do have were wonderful memories. Um, my grandfather coming home from work, I was always downstairs in their house. My dad suffered from severe mental illness. Um, he was a manic, manic depressive, and as much so far, like he had shock treatments. He was on lithium, the whole nine yards. At the time, my mom, um, I didn't even know what codependency was, uh, you know, until like uh, now, actually, long ago. I had an idea as I was growing, but my mom was so codependent um, on my father. But my father was so unhappy with his own life that nothing could make him happy. Not my mother, you know, according to him, only his kids made him happy. So when I was five, my father moved out for the, for the first time. We still lived at my grandparents' house. He got a girlfriend. Uh, I vaguely remember meeting her once. He took us horseback riding with her. Um, but that was very short-lived. He ended up moving back home and told my mother that would stay until his children were grown and <clears throat> that he was going to leave so we could stay in contact with him. I guess his fear was that she wasn't going to let us talk to him. So he came home and life was, you know, life was very weird. The day, months that he would stay in bed, um, he would not shave, barely recognizable as my the father that I knew. Um, we moved to Staten Island when I was six because my dad's way to not let anybody know that things were um, bad at home were, was to just not be around. So he didn't want my grandfather to know or any of my uncles, uh, my mother's uncles, but he didn't want anybody to know. You know, he was living this this life that did not exist. And we moved to Staten Island. We saw we saw family occasionally, and for that, I guess my dad was well enough to pretend that he was happy. Um, The first house we lived in was on a block with kids all the same age as my brother and I, and it was my brothers and I. And uh, it was great. The families got along. The the parents got along. The kids always played outside. It was the perfect childhood. I mean, I had. I had great friends that I'm still friends with to this day. Um, when I was eight years old, my brother, he's the middle child, I'm the youngest, he decided that he was going to uh, 
we were playing in the basement. That was like our play place. And he wanted to play doctor. And I didn't know any better. I was eight years old. My mother opened the door and called for dinner and nothing happened. You know, for many years, I think I just blocked that out because up until I went to therapy when I was a teenager, I didn't even, I thought that that was something that I, I made up in my head. Um, I guess because I didn't want it to be real. My father left when I was 13 years old and it was my very first day of high school. I came home and he was packing the car to leave. No warning. Well, no warning to us. I guess my mother knew. He had a girlfriend. She had two children and he was leaving. Now, my father didn't drink and he didn't do any type of drugs, but he was involved in stuff that was very shady, uh, and we had family that was like mob related back then, which I'm not very proud of. And uh, my father was involved in things that were, you know, I mean, it went from um, selling drugs to using stolen credit cards. But I didn't know any of that when I was when I was younger. So he leaves. He moves out when I'm 13. And my desire to have a relationship with my father was so strong that I accepted his girlfriend. And uh, and that was that. My father was so prejudiced growing up. My very One of my very best friends in school was a, a black girl. And I wasn't allowed to have her come over the house. Ironically enough, my father moved out with a black woman. So that was kind of like a slap in the face. Like I couldn't be friends with a girl because of the color of her skin in his eyes, but it was okay for him to have a relationship. And he judged people, which uh, one thing I'm very proud of, I don't judge anybody. And um, I think he helped me to see that. That's what, not what I wanted to be. Uh, so I, I accepted his girlfriend and her children because I wanted to have a relationship with my dad. My mother was angry. She was very angry. When my dad left, she completely disconnected from the whole world. She could not function without him. She needed somebody to tell her what to do, how to do it, when to do it. Uh, she didn't work because that's the way that my father wanted it. He wanted her dependent on him. She didn't work. And um, she had to, she was in her early 40s, I believe. And she had to learn to get a job and to function as an adult woman. Cause all she knew was being a mom and a housewife. She knew how to cook and clean and she had very bad OCD, which I thank her for cause now I do. And um, mm -hmm. uh, so she, she, she also got very depressed and she changed. She, I just wanted like a mom to help me do homework or, you know, watch a TV show with me. She, she wasn't capable of doing any of that. She, she became very, uh, I don't know if selfish is the right word to use, but she was very self-involved. It became about her. And I guess for many years, I can understand it now. I didn't, I didn't then, but I guess for many years, it was never about her. It was always about my dad. So, and us, you know, uh, so, now it was going to be about her, and that was it. I was a rebellious teenager. Um, if it was wrong, I did it. <laughs> uh, I didn't do, you know, uh, I didn't want to go to school. Um, I ended up getting my GED. I didn't, I didn't want to come in on time. I didn't want to listen to a curfew. If, if it was not a good thing to do, I, I did the exact opposite. What was good? I did, uh, you know, being, being a parent now, I totally understand what I put my mother through having three, three children, but then I didn't. Uh, and I, and I think that learning now, I think it was my way to get attention, to seek attention from her. Um, cause any attention was going to be good attention as opposed to no attention at all. When I was 17 years old, I went out to this party that I was not supposed to be at, and I got, I was sexually assaulted by two people at the party, two people that I knew, two people I thought was supposed to be my friend, friends, mm -hmm. and uh, I went home, and my brother Anthony, he's the middle, I, I told him, 
And it was a whole, obviously it was a whole big to do. I had to go to the hospital. I had to speak to the police. They got arrested. It was just, my life changed forever. I, I did not trust anybody, especially a man after that. Um, and not that I didn't trust men. I trusted men, but I did not trust men when it came to, when I got older and it came to being sexually involved with people, I didn't, tr I didn't tr trust anybody. Um, I felt like I couldn't control what happened to me. So I was going to control anything else. I decided that I was fat and I was not, I was 17 years old and I was about 117 pounds foot nine. I was a healthy body weight. So I, uh, I became what they said was bulimorexic and, um, I got down to 85 pounds and I was hospitalized for three months with a feeding tube. And I still thought I was fat. They told me that I had body BMDD, body dysmorphia disorder. And, um, and it's true. I never see myself to this day. I don't see myself the way other people see me. I could lose weight and I'm still fat. I could be, uh, some people have it the reverse. Some people are very heavy and they think that they look fine and it gives them the ability to continue to eat and continue to do the behavior that's not healthy for them. Me, it doesn't matter what my weight is. Um, I'm always unhappy with myself, even in program. Like I, I really try, I'm, I'll be February 13th. I'll be a year in LA abstinent for six months of that year. Uh, but that's awesome. I, yeah, I try. Um, every day is a work in progress. But I always try to see myself the, with in love, loving, caring manner. But it doesn't always work. It's not always, you know. Um, I let other people, I let too many people's opinions influence how I feel. So I met my, my husband. My, he was my first well, I'm married twice, but this was my first husband. We were very young. Uh, I was 19, he was 17 when I met him. We got married when I was 21 and he was 19. I was pregnant. Had I not been pregnant with my oldest daughter, I would never have gotten married. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I would have ever gotten married. But my family at that time had this insane idea that marriage is not an old shirt and you don't just throw it away when you're done with it. And you're, preg you're pregnant and you're Catholic and you have to be married. So I did what oh, I yeah. wanted to do. And, uh, you know, I still find myself, you know, it's funny, Gary, I still find myself doing what other people want me to do to this day. So, yes. um, so I got married and I had three kids back to back. Uh, my daughter was born in 1996. My son was born in 1997 and my youngest daughter was born in 1999. I felt like I was pregnant forever. Um, but, and, and every time I wasn't pregnant, I got pregnant again. So, uh, and my, my husband was physically and mentally abusive. Uh, when I was pregnant with my last child, he, that was the last straw. He threw me down the steps. I was eight months pregnant and I decided that I was going to leave him. My mother could not understand that. Uh, you're going to, these children will have no father. You know, and I was strong enough to say, you know, that they'll have a father, but just not one that lives with me. I, you know, I wasn't going to tolerate that anymore. So I left him. I moved back in with my mother. Because uh, at that time, I didn't work either. I was turning into my mother. I was everything that she was. Uh, my husband didn't want me to work. And I didn't work. I stayed home. I took care of the kids. And I... And that wasn't even like financially feasible. It it was just what he wanted. And I did what he wanted. So I left him. I went back to school. I became an emergency medical technician. And I worked EMS in New York City. Uh, up for probably about 16 years before I became disabled. But I was happy. I was happy for the first time. I was happy helping other people feeling needed, uh, you know, in a way that, that I never felt before. Um, that's a good addiction to have. <laughs> yeah. So probably the best one. So yeah. um, during that time, from the time I met my husband to the time I met my current husband, there was one person in between. And he was 
an alcoholic, but I didn't know that then because I was not really exposed to alcoholism. And he was also physically and verbally abusive. I thought that was a very short-lived relationship. That was about 13, 14 months. Uh, and I got away from that when his true colors really started to show. And then I decided that I swore off men and I was going to be alone for the rest of my life with just me and my children. You know, I would go on dates, but I was, I was not committing to anybody. So one day I, I show up at work and my current husband was, well, he was a paramedic in the same hospital that I worked in. And, uh, you know, he's trying to have conversation and, I was so mean. <laughs> I was typical. I was a typical um, stuck up. I thought I was too good for everybody. Staten Island girl, like they called me. I worked in Brooklyn. So I didn't pay him any attention. He asked me out to lunch several times. And uh, finally, I said, fine, lunch. Well, go to lunch because you won't leave me alone. That was my answer. I didn't say, okay, yes. <laughs> I didn't say thank you for the invitation. I just said, fine, you won't any other way, so I'll go to lunch with you. And we had lunch. And uh, and and he said, let's have dinner. So I said, oh, now this is getting carried away, you know, dinner. I don't want to have a relationship. He said, don't worry, me either. I said, um, I said, we will, we will. <laughs> Sorry. It's okay, it I happens. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, so we'll have, we went to dinner and at dinner, I said to him, here's the story. I can never have children. I had my tubes tied and I am never getting married again. And he said, that's okay. I have a daughter and I never want to get married in the first place. He was never married. I said, okay, so this will be perfect. We started to see each other and Eric was in the army. He was in, uh, in the army reserves and he had to go away for three weeks for training shortly after we decided that we were going to date. So that was good for me because I didn't like anybody in my space. Um, I didn't, I had like my per, I had personal space. That's what I used to say at work. Like this is my personal space and nobody could come into my space uh, because it was that fear of somebody wanting to touch me, or hug me or say hello to me, you know, I could talk to you from a distance. Like this was my square, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. So it was good. We were dating, but he was gone for three weeks. That was the perfect relationship. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> like I said, any better than that. We would talk on the phone at night and I was working. Oh, fine. He comes home and we, you know, we really started to, to have a relationship. We started dating in 2006. 2006 yeah. In 2007, my oldest brother passed away. And uh, he was born a severe asthmatic. Um, he was born a severe asthmatic, and he also had a uh, mental illness. He he suffered from severe anxiety. I think we all did. We all had anxiety. Uh, it, I think it was just growing up in our house, um, and he had several medical problems, in, including with the, the asthma, and he had something called degenerative disc disease. So the doctor had given him, uh, it was July 7th, the doctor gave him the night before a prescription for liquid morphine for the pain. And that night, he had said to my mom, he lived with my mother, he took care of her, uh, and he said to my mother, I'm itchy, and he must have been having an allergic reaction. So he took a Benadryl. But I guess between the narcotic and the morphine and the Benadryl, it suppressed his respiratory system enough and he died in his sleep. And um, my mother found him the next morning and, you know, naturally uh, I received a phone call. And on the other end of the phone is my aunt. And she didn't say, I picked up the phone, her exact words were, your brother is dead. <laughs> so, like, I mean, that was some phone call, you know, and uh how do you handle, how does one person handle that? So I did exactly what I knew how to do. Now, for the couple of years that I had gone to therapy and maintained a healthy body weight, it all came back to me. I just, I stopped eating. Um, I think it was seven days that I had no food. Uh, I lost 14 pounds in seven days. 
all I would do was drink water. I was planning a, a funeral for, with my mother. I was going to the cemetery, doing all these things. And I always put myself at the bottom of the list. Uh, I still do that. So food was the, the last thing. I now know that it was a punishment. I punished myself with food for all these years, but then I didn't think that, you know? Um, and I guess if I had to attribute the the food to my brother dying was that I wasn't there to do anything to help him. I wasn't there to assist in saving his life. So that was my punishment. I was going to punish myself. Um, so... I was 30 when my brother died. Uh, yeah, 30. Wow. Um, I got, I lost 14 pounds. I was back down to like 124 pounds and I, I looked really sick. I didn't look good. I didn't look healthy. And Eric, my husband now was my boyfriend at that time. Uh, you know, he would tell me you need to put some weight on. That was like, that was like the devil speaking to me, like put weight on. Are you crazy? You know, I'm not going to gain weight. So I, I did gain a little bit of weight and I, and I was healthy again. I was happy. You know, we were, we, we were happy. My mom got sick very early before my brother, before my brother passed away. He was her caretaker. So when he died, I made the decision to move back in with my mother and take care of her. And Eric helped me. And I was rough as an adult woman to move back in with the woman who I now understand was extremely narcissistic and I was going to move back in with her. Uh, it was rough. You know, I still worked. Being around her brought back so many memories, anger. Um, when my mother, my mother then passed away in 2010. And in the meantime, my dad passed away in 2008. There was never any time to grieve. And it was easier that way because I didn't have to feel emotion. You know, I would just either starve mm -hmm. myself or, or eat too much. It, either way, I was never dealing with emotion. So in 2010, Eric, we got married. Eric was deployed. He did a stateside deployment. And while he was gone, I, I was diagnosed with a brain tumor, a cancerous brain tumor. And um, so I, I went through a lot of treatment, chemotherapy. I have lupus. I have fibromyalgia. I have, um, my, I have, I have a degenerative disease in my spine and my, my eyes as well. So you name it, I have it. And Eric was gone. Uh, and during that time, he, I feel like, you know, this is just my feeling, but I feel like everything was more important than at home. Uh, everything was more important than his life at home. I feel like the military was so important. And he, I felt like he didn't care about me. Um, so I started to resent the military and I made his life miserable, miserable. Uh, every time he'd have to go to drill, Everything that had to do with the military, I made his life miserable. Now, Eric drinks um, sometimes more than others, a little bit more than I care for. But, you know, I now I have now learned that it is not my decision how much Eric drinks. And I had to just give it to God because if I didn't, I probably wouldn't be married anymore. Um, and for all those years, he was resenting me too. So while I was resenting him, he was feeling the same way towards me that I was making his life miserable. Oh, a lot of things happened in between that time. You know, I started to gain a lot of weight. I was not active. I became, I became pretty depressed, but I would never admit that. You know, I always smiled. I always smiled. Everybody was like, I'm not depressed, you know? Uh, I was anxious. The anxiety was through the roof. But I, I would never admit that I was depressed. Almost three years ago, we moved to Pennsylvania, which I hated. And I started to resent him again. And he eating then got so out of control. The worst it's ever been in my life. 
I didn't care. I didn't care what I ate. I didn't care what I looked like. Well, I thought I didn't care what I looked like, but subconsciously, I really did care because every time I ate something, I would be disgusted when I looked in the mirror. Um, so we move and I was miserable. Um, and then that brings us to a year ago when I just, it was like the beginning of February and my daughter was getting married in April and I just could not stand myself anymore. So I, I heard about OA and I went to my first meeting I went online and I Googled it and I went to my first meeting and I thought, this is crazy. These people are crazy and I am not staying here. But then the more that I listened, uh, the first meeting I went to had about 200 people in it. The more that I listened, I, you, know, you start to think, well, oh, this is me, or I do these things, or my behavior is this way. So I said, maybe I should stick around. I said, and if nothing else, I'm going to lose weight, you know? Uh, even though at the beginning they tell you that this is not a diet club, in my mind, it was a diet club. Somebody was going to tell me what to eat, and I was going to lose weight just like they did. So I stuck around. Um, I made some really great friends, and I really did not start practicing the program until about six months ago. The first six months I was in it, I mean, I did service, I I came to meetings, I read my book, I wrote, but I did not fully give it to God and trust in a power higher than myself until about six months ago when I realized that I'm going to kill myself. One way or another, my heart will not be able to take my behavior. And I just surrendered, which is something I never thought I would do. I never thought I would be able to surrender. So even though I didn't work the program for six months, coming in was this was the best decision I've ever made. And staying was an even better decision. And that's where I'm now. Very cool. Um, Danielle, I know that in meetings you shared before about the aha moment or the calling from God that you received. Could you go into a little more detail about that? So Saturday, it was a, it was a Friday actually. And I was arguing with my husband, which wasn't new because I wanted my point to be heard. And, um, um, I think it was like the end of August, I want to say. I wanted my point to be heard, and it didn't matter how what I was going to say made anybody else feel, because I was important. You know, I spent so many years not being important that now it was going to be all about me. Exactly what I disliked in my mother. So, um, we had an argument, and he, for the for one, of, one of the very few times in 16 years, he used the explicit language and he said if this is what you want to do and this is what you want to hear then I'll tell you and he never shared his feeling like that before and um and I just sat and thought to myself oh my god like what have I done for all these years what have I done to him how have I treated him and at that moment I realized that God's plan for me was to stay in a way because had I come and, and so I wasn't losing weight prior to that, right? And that's why I was staying. That at that moment, that was the only reason I was staying. So I realized that his plan for me was to stay. Because had I not stayed, if I would have lost the weight, I would have been gone. Had I not stayed, that wouldn't have happened. That was so eye-opening that oh my God, you are this person and you're turning into exactly you have turned into exactly what you did never wanted to be. So I apologized. <laughs> I actually really apologized. Uh, you know, through the years, I've always said I'm sorry, but it was pretty much just to end an argument, never to uh, really, I never really meant right. it. And, uh, and I apologized. And I, and it was very, it was from my heart. And I, I really have taken every step every single day since. I'm not perfect, and I still make mistakes, and I'm still bitchy. You know, uh, it's, I think it's no, just, never. It's, <laughs> it's just me, but I have taken steps to 
correct past behavior. I try to love myself a little bit more each day, but not so much that I don't care about other people and their feelings. And, uh, and I'm changing and you know what? I still haven't lost a lot of weight, maybe eight pounds in a year, but the things that I've gained are so much more important than the losing the weight. Cool. That was my moment. Um, you know, I was very eye opening. Yeah. I know. I remember that all the time yeah. because we, they talk about it in program when you have that aha moment or the light bulb goes on. Mm-hmm. And and I didn't really understand that until you had shared that day in that meeting, what that I aha moment so. would be. Right. I think me, what it actually meant was I was listening when all the time before that I wasn't listening to anybody else. I wasn't absorbing how I treated other people. It was only about how people treated me. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and that is, that was not a good feeling might I add. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh my, who am I? And what have I done for all these years, you know? Um, but it was what I needed at that time. I needed to change because everything in my life was wrong. My marriage was, you know, while nobody would think it was it was not great, it was it was not healthy. Um I I probably could have been a better mom or you know more understanding. Uh, you know, I did exactly what my mother did. I made sure that my kids have everything they needed financially, physically, and, you know, that was supposed to be enough, you know. Mm-hmm. So I guess the next thing I would ask is, what would you tell the new person that's sitting here, I'm kind of on the fence, should I do A, should I not do A? What can you tell them that might drive them to click on that Zoom link and go to the meeting? Or I even go to an in-person meeting. What I would say to anybody new coming into any 12-step program is you have to stick with the feelings. Because I think that in any type of addiction, we've used our addiction to mask feelings. And uh, if you get through the detox, whether it be from sugar and flour or alcohol or drugs, if you can get through that and you can stick feeling all those feelings, what you gain from a from a 12-step program is it, it's just eye-opening for me. It was eye-opening for me and it was mm-hmm. it made every relationship in my life better and it's making me a better person. So you know, like they say, stay till the miracle happens. It's really true. Stay. And then mm. stay after. Yeah. Stay after and hear about the miracle. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. And Danielle, I can honestly say you are a miracle in this program. You know, you've helped me out tremendously. You know, you're, well, you, you, me too. you keep me accountable even when I don't want to be. You know, well, you know that's so. good because you do this. Hey. Yeah, I think that's something that with the way, and I know it's that way, I believe that's the way in other 12 step is you get a group of people that are like your accountability people and you do, and your outreach people. And I can definitely say you're definitely one of those for me. And, you know, that's awesome. That's for sure. And I appreciate it. Trust me. I appreciate you and everything that you do for me as well. Right. So cool. Is there anything else you'd like to add or correct or anything? <laughs> no, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. That's my life in a nutshell. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Well, Danielle, thank you so much for doing this. It's been awesome. And I think you're going to change a lot of lives with this podcast. Well, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. All right. Let me.